Hello and welcome. In this video we are going to talk about conformal mappings, which is a concept in complex analysis that I know can be really hard to wrap your head around at first glance. So that is why I am going to try in this video to really break down all the theory behind conformal mappings and also show you step by step how to solve these kinds of problems by using different methods so that you can decide for yourself which one that works best for you. And remember that you can always find the timestamps and additional resources in the description. So without further ado, let's get going. The first thing you need to know is that a conformal map is just a non-name for a function which fulfills some conditions. We say that a function is conformal if it preserves angles locally. So, in short, a conformal map is just a function that preserves angles. But this leads us to our next question, which is, what angles are we really talking about here? And I thought that I would answer this question by presenting a slightly different version of this definition, by drawing of it. So, here we have two directed smooth curves, which intersects at the point C0. The angle between the two curves at C0 is not defined as one might think, as simply the angle between the two curves, but instead it is defined as the angle between the two tangent vectors of the curves at C0. And note here that the tangent vectors are pointing in the directions consistent with the orientation of the curves. Let's continue by looking at the image of the curves under some function f. The point C0 might have ended up around here somewhere, with the curves coming in something like this. And if we now, once again, define the angle between these two new curves at this new intersection with the help of a tangent vectors, we get the following image. And with that done, I can finally state the following. A function f is conformal at a point C0 if the angles alpha and alpha prime are equal for every pair of directed smooth curves that intersects at this point C0. This is in fact just another way to illustrate the properties of a conformal mapping, which we stated in the first definition. But I hope that we here can more clearly visualize the angles in question, the angles that need to be the same for the mapping to be conformal. Now we will continue with another theorem, where we once again will see that analytic functions are superior to all other functions. Because this theorem states that an analytic function is always conformal at the point C0 if the derivative at this point is not equal to zero. I will add a link to the proof of this theorem in the description, but just take my word for it in the meantime, because we will need this information when we now continue to talk about Mobius transformations, where a Mobius transformation is defined as any function that can be written on this form here, where the coefficients a, b, c, and d are complex numbers satisfying that a times d minus b times c is not equal to zero. If we look at the derivative of the function, we can see why this condition is important. Since here we can see that if a times d minus b times c is equal to zero, then the derivative will also be equal to zero, which means that the function above is only a constant and will therefore map all input values to the same point. But even more important is that here we can see that the derivative of a Mobius transformation is never equal to zero, thanks to this condition. Therefore, according to our last theorem, we know that a Mobius transformation is conformal at every point except at its pole, since this is the only point where the function is no longer analytic. And this is one of the reasons why Mobius transformations are normally used when solving problems about conformal mappings. And the next thing we are going to talk about is how this function is connected with some of the most elementary transformations. The first transformation we are going to talk about is called translation, 
which is when a function moves every point of a figure by the same distance in a given direction. For example, in this image we can see that this rectangle, determined by the origin and the letters a, b and c, under this mapping, has been moved by the same amount and in the same direction determined by the complex number b. Rotation is the next transformation we are going to talk about, and it is simply the act of rotating every point of a figure around the origin. The function that does this can be defined as the following. And here we can see that the amount we are rotating by is determined by the angle alpha. The third transformation is called magnification, and this transformation simply enlarges or contracts the distance of every point from the origin by the same factor. For example, this function here enlarges the figure by the factor 2. But note also here that the distance between any two points is multiplied by the same factor. The last transformation is called inversion, and it is defined as the function 1 divided by c. And to understand what this function do, let's continue by rewriting c as the following expression. And here you can visualize the absolute value of c as the length of a complex number, while the second factor corresponds to the orientation of the same complex number. If we now calculate 1 divided by c, we get the following. And here we can see that this mapping changed both the length and the orientation of every point. The new length is going to be equal to 1 divided by the old length and the new orientation of a complex number is simply the old orientation but with a change of sign. The good thing to know about this transformation is that it always maps generalized circles to generalized circles. Which is just a fancy way of saying that it always maps a line or a circle to either a line or a circle. For example, by using this transformation, this line that passes through the origin will be mapped to another line, but this time with another orientation. Meanwhile, this circle that does not touch the origin will be mapped to another circle. And note here that the key difference between these two cases is not that one of them is a circle, and the other one is a line. Instead, the key difference is that one of them passes through the origin and the other one does not, because inversion of circles and lines works the way that if the original line or circle passes through the origin, then its image will contain the point at infinity, since we get 1 divided by 0 at this point, so the image must therefore be a line. But if the original line or circle misses the origin, then its image will be bounded, hence it must be a circle. These four transformations relates to the Mobius transformation by the fact that any Mobius transformation can be expressed as the composition of a finite sequence of translations, rotations, magnifications and inversions. So this theorem tells us that a Mobius transformation is only a combination of these other four transformations, which means that you only need to understand these four different kinds of transformations to be able to determine a Mobius transformation. And I thought I would continue by showing you exactly what I mean by that, by doing some examples. In this example, I would like us to determine the Mobius transformation that maps the rectangle with the following four corners in the c-plane onto another rectangle with these corners in the w-plane. Note that the mapping must be done so that the point c1 is mapped to w1 and c2 to w2 and so on. Let's start by drawing the two rectangles and mark all the corners. And I would also recommend you to always draw the two figures in question when trying to solve a conformal mapping problem, since this makes it more easy for us to see how we have to transform our first figure to get to the second one by using these transformations to the right. We can for example start by noticing that the rectangle in the w-plane 
is orientated in a different way compared to our rectangle in the seaplane. They differ by rotation of 90 degrees, but we can fix this by rotating our figure 90 degrees or 2 pi anti-clockwise. So by using this formula for rotation, we get the following, which we can simplify to this, since e raised to the power of i times pi divided by 2 is equal to i. The next thing we can do is to adjust the size of a figure, since we can see here that our new rectangle is only one long and a half high. Meanwhile, the other one is two long and one high. So we need to use magnification to make our new rectangle twice as big, which we can do by using the following function. And now you might wonder why we are using f1 and not c in this formula. And that is because we are transforming our new rectangle and not the one we started with. And our new rectangle was the result of our first transformation, f1. So that is why we are using f1 and not c. Now we can see that the figure seems to match pretty well, but we still need to move our figure a bit up, which we can do with translation. To determine the amount we need to translate it with, we can for example observe that the point c1 is located at the origin at the moment, but we would like it to be one step up along the imaginary axis, right? Since that is where w1 is located in our last figure. By using this formula for translation, with b is equal to i, we get the following. And this one should move our last figure, which was the result of the function f2, one step up along the imaginary axis. And now we have actually succeeded to map our rectangle in the c-plane to this new rectangle in the w-plane, so that the corners correspond correctly. But the last thing we need to do is to go backwards and add all the results from all of these transformations together, so that our final answer is only expressed as one function and not as the composition of three. So by inserting the expressions of the function f1 and the function f2, into our function f3, we get the following. And this thing is our final answer. This is our Mobius transformation, since a Mobius transformation is always made up of a sequence of these other four transformations. And that is why I said before that you only really need to know these four transformations to be able to solve these kinds of problems. Let us do another example, but this time I would like us to determine a Mobius transformation that maps this circle here onto this circle. For starters, by drawing them both, we can note that the circles are different in regards to the size. The first one has a radius of 1, while the second one has a radius of 2. But the positions of the circles also differ, since one of them is centered around 1, while the other one is centered around 3i divided by 2. Let's continue by moving the circle to the origin, which we can do by using translation, with b is equal to minus 1, since we want to move the center of a circle one step to the left along the real axis. And the next thing we would like to do is to adjust the size of the circle by a factor of 2, by using the formula for magnification. And once again, remember that we are transforming the last figure and not the one we started with. And that is why we are using the function f1 and not c. Now that the size is correct, we just need to move it so it is centered correctly. Our figure is centered around the origin, right? But we would like it to be centered around the point 3i divided by 2, as the circle is in the last image. And we can do that by once again using translation, but this time by adding 3i divided by 2 to our last figure. Now we once again go backwards and combine the results of each of the transformations to get the final expression, which will be our Mobius transformation. But note that this is not the only answer to this problem. There is actually an infinite amount of Mobius transformations that works for this problem. So let me know in the comments if you can find another one. In this problem, 
we are going to determine a Mobius transformation that maps the inside of a unit circle onto the right half plane. The major difference between this problem and the other ones we have done is that here we are dealing with an area inside of a figure instead of only the figure itself. And we are therefore going to need to keep track of this area as we go along. But we are still going to focus on transforming the circle since the area is contained inside the circle. First off, we need to transform the circle to a line, which we can do by using inversion. But here we must remember that to get a line, we need to make sure that we are choosing our expression for the function smart. Since we need our circle to pass through a point, which makes our function divide by zero, since this will make the image contain infinity and therefore must be a line. We cannot get this result by using 1 divided by 0 as our transformation, since the circle never passes through the origin. But we can use one of the following expressions, since the circle passes through points that makes each of them divide by 0 at least once. Note here that all of them are valid transformations to transform our circle to a line, but they are going to have different properties regarding where we place the line and how they map the area inside the circle. But just choose one of them, and then we can adjust these properties afterwards with additional transformations. So let's continue by using the function here for example. Then the next step is to determine exactly how it maps our circle to our new line. And we can do that by inserting some points which lies on the circle and see where the function maps them. The function maps the point 1 to infinity, which is great, since now we know that we are dealing with a line as we wanted. And the function maps i to minus 1 divided by 2 minus i divided by 2. And it maps minus 1 to minus 1 divided by 2. And lastly, it maps minus i to minus 1 divided by 2 plus i divided by 2. And by marking these points here on the graph, we get the following line. And that's great, because we have succeeded in creating our line as we wanted. But now the million dollar question is, where did the area inside the circle get mapped to? This area can only be mapped to either the left or the right side of this line. And one way to determine this is to take one point that makes up the area, let's say the origin for example, and then we see where it went. Here you can see that this point got mapped to minus 1, right? So this means that the whole inside of a circle is going to be mapped to the left side of our line. Another way to determine the same thing is to go along the circle and note which side the area is on with respect to the orientation, since this property will not change after the transformation. So if we, for example, go from the top here, from i to minus 1, and then to minus i, then we can note that the area is to the left of us with respect to the orientation we are traveling. And if we now travel along the same points after they have been remapped, then we know that the area will still be on our left side which also corresponds with the result we got before. The next thing we have to adjust is the position of our figure, since the line goes along the imaginary axis in the last image. And we can do this by doing a translation, by adding 1 divided by 2 to our last figure, right? So it should look something like this. And the last thing we need to fix is that the area needs to be on the right side of the line, right? And since we know that the area is directly connected with the orientation, we can get this result by flipping the line 180 degrees, or pi. Because now we will have to go down instead of up to follow the same path as we did before. Which means that the left side of the line, with respect to the orientation we are traveling downwards, which contains the area in question, will be on the right side of the complex plane which is exactly what we wanted. The Mobius transformation, which we wanted to determine, can therefore be determined by going backwards once again. So if we insert the expressions of the functions f2 and f1 into our function f3, we get the following. And if we now write the two divisions on the same line, 
we can see that we can simplify the expression as the following. And here we can simply factor out 1 divided by 2, which will give us the following. And the final thing I would like to do is to factor out minus 1 in the numerator and the denominator, since these two factors eliminate each other. And now this thing here will be our final answer. But now I'm going to show you another method that you can use to solve these kinds of problems. But note that this method can only be used if you know how three points are mapped. And this comes from the fact that a Mobius transformation is uniquely determined by knowing two sets of distinct points. The points C1, C2, C3, which are the points we are going to map and the corresponding points W1, W2, and W3, which are the same points, but after they have been mapped. The transformation is then given by solving this equation here for W. And this equation comes from the fact that a Mobius transformation always preserves the cross ratios. To the left side here, you have a cross ratio before the mapping. And to the right side you have a cross ratio after a mapping for these points in question. And these two cross ratios are always going to be equal in the case of a Mobius transformation. Let's continue by redoing our first example, but this time by using this method instead. So here we actually know how four different points are mapped. But since we only need three of them to use the formula, I'm going to discard the pair C4 and W4 in this case. If we now start by inserting our starting points, which are the following C values, into our formula, we get the following. And if we now insert where these points are going, which are the W values, into the formula, we get the following expression. And now we just have to solve this equation for W, which is easier said than done. So hang on tight. We can start by removing all the zeros in the left side of the equation. And we can also simplify the right side of the equation by noticing that we have i minus 2i up here and down here we have i minus i. So if we simplify this, we get the following. The next step is to get everything on the same level, which we can accomplish by multiplying both sides of the equation with the other side's denominator, which will give us the following. If we now write out the multiplication, we get the following. And here we can see that we have w times 2ic and w times c on both sides of the equation. And we can therefore remove them, since they eliminate each other. So, we end up with an equation that looks something like this. And now we can factor out the w on the right side of the equation, which will give us the following. And now we can get the expression for w by dividing both sides with i minus 1 divided by 2. And we can simplify this expression by multiplying up and down here with the complex conjugate of a denominator, since this will create a real number in the denominator. So let's see, in this case we are going to end up with 5 divided by 4 down here as a real number. And by now expanding the numerator, we get the following. And here we can observe that we have minus c and c, so they eliminate each other. But the same thing happens with minus 1 divided by 2 and 1 divided by 2 over here. And for the next step I'm going to sidetrack a bit, because here we need to note that 2ic plus ic divided by 2 is equal to 5 divided by 4 times 2ic. And we also need to know that i plus i divided by 4 is equal to 5 divided by 4 times i. And this is important because now we can use this knowledge to factor out 5 divided by 4 in both the numerator and the denominator, which will give us the following. And now, by doing one last simplification and removing the 5 divided by 4 here, 
we get our final answer, which we can note is the same answer as the one we got here above. So there you have it, two different ways of solving the same problem, and it is all up to you to choose which one to use. This video became rather long, but I really hope that you learned something new about conformal mappings, and that you feel like you have some methods to use to tackle these kinds of problems. And just let me know in the comments if you have any questions. Thanks for watching.